Hi everybody and welcome back to my front porch. I promised you guys a, a tongue making video and I got all excited and made it. So we're going to do that today. But uh, in the meantime, why don't you guys pause, get a cup of coffee, tea, beer, whiskey, whatever you feel like. Whatever makes you comfortable. And I'll see you after that. Okay, so today we're making some flat jaw tongs, like we said in the intro. <clears throat> so I bought these as a kit from an organization called Ken's Custom Iron. Uh, I am not affiliated with them in any way, any way shape, or form. So, yeah, I'm going to link to them anyway. About the cheapest way to get new tongs that I know of. So, yeah, as you can see here, they come flat, but I don't want flat. I want them to have a 90 degree turn in the jaws so that they actually hold on to metal. And to do that, I bend them both the same direction, which is seems, seems wrong, but uh, realize you're going to flip one over and put them together that way. That makes it so that the, the jaws actually work together to hold things. And I used my trusty crescent hammer to do it. The instructions I got adv advised to uh, kind of draw out the ends a little bit to help pull things out of the fire easier. I think this is for a coal forge, but I haven't ruled out the use of coal. So yeah, I'm going to do it. And not much really, just a light beveling. There's still about a quarter inch material there anyway. Well, it'll also help keep the jaws straight, bent the right way. And now it's time to start punching the hole for the rivet to go through. I learned a lot about punching holes in this experience here. Most of it I kind of knew already. I actually have punched a hole before and done that, drifted it out, but this time um, I, it had been a while, I made some mistakes and I learned about them. There you go. Um, one, it's important to make sure that when you start punching your hole from the other side, you get it perfectly lined up. It makes it a lot easier to get the, uh, the material you're punching out out of the hole. It's hard to do, but it is important. Two, I really need to get me an anvil, which I haven't got my stimulus check yet, but when it comes, that is on my list. Um, and since the, the budget just got a little better for that, I'm probably going to get the anvil I was looking at originally. Um, can link to that too, actually. That'll be fun. Also learned by trying to hammer a hole in on the anvil over there that you need a place for the material you're punching out to go which is why I stopped doing that here in a little bit and start hammering it over the vise again this vise is not really meant for that but so I don't really like doing it yet another reason I need an anvil but the uh, 
the material you're punching out needs somewhere to go, and I don't have a hole in my railroad track, and I don't think I could drill one if I wanted to. Maybe if I had a friend with a machine shop that could happen, but even then, I think I'd owe him quite a lot of beer in order to make that happen. So I mentioned needing a proper anvil for that, and uh, the reason is that on a proper anvil, you have a hole, a little round hole called a pritchel hole, and it's specifically for punching holes, drifting them, and stuff like that. They make them in varying sizes but it is a common pattern or common feature on all modern production anvils these days some older ones don't have it actually but you got to go back quite a ways to find them without like anything you find in the u.s should have it side note i've considered getting one of those cheap cast iron um harbor freight anvils for 50 bucks just to have the holes in the anvil that you would need that would be the Pritchell hole and the Hardy hole. I wouldn't use that horn for anything. Honestly, uh, two or three good whacks and it'd probably come right off. But being able to use Hardy tools and punch holes would be a fantastic addition to my current setup. And as you can see, I can punch a hole. It just takes a lot of determination and risk. I'm eventually going to break that vice doing this. Not that it's such a bad thing, but... It, well, yeah, that is a bad thing. Breaking your tools sucks. But... This one, I'm using a homeowner's vice, and it was never meant for the kind of use I'm putting it through. So... My other option here was to drill that material out, and that's that would be easy enough. Uh, well, how that works is you would need a center punch, you would need to center punch the hole to get it started because drill bits don't know where to go through metal and they don't know, they don't, uh, they don't cut well unless you give them a position to start in, a little divot that you can make with a center punch. So. You do that, and then on top of that, you need to make sure you have a, the right drill bit. All the ones at the hardware store say they go through wood, metal, and masonry, at least in the general use bits. And you should know that's a lie. And by metal, they mean aluminum, not steel that's five eighths of an inch thick. You can, you can drill that hole. But it'll be the last time you use that specific drill bit. And I don't feel like replacing them every single time I do it. Especially since a 516 bit is, well, not really expensive, but if you're buying a new one every time you drill a hole, not cheap. Another thing I learned here is why we harden our punches. When I made my punch set, I thought, you know what, I'm only going to be hitting soft, red-hot steel. I don't need my punch to be hard. And I was wrong. Theoretically, yeah, I don't. Um, your punch only needs to be harder than the, the material it's punching through but it also needs to be hard enough to not deform when it starts compressing that material and pushing against the uh, mass of your anvil behind it. So I managed to um, cause the material at the end of my punch to swell quite a bit. This is called upsetting, by the way. I'm gonna do it on purpose later on another project but on my punches, I'm not terribly happy about it. 
So, at some point, I need to heat treat my punches. This is the same as you would do with a knife. You get it hot enough to, that it's non-magnetic, dunk it in oil, let it cool off, and then temper it. Uh, in this case, uh, the tempering doesn't have to be exact. You just do it with a torch or something. But yeah. Right about now, my punch should start going through the material instead of, yeah, yeah, it definitely has. I'm whacking it on the anvil. <clears throat> but yeah, my punch went through the material, so I should be done punching a hole, right? Well, not exactly. I have, but that doesn't mean that hole is wide enough. See, this rivet is a lot bigger than the end of my punch. So, I need to widen that hole so that it'll fit the rivet. And that's done by a process called drifting. And you kind of start with start drifting metal out with, uh, with your punch, because it's tapered to allow for that exactly. But in bigger holes, you actually would need a, a tool called a drift. Anyway, this works by forcing a tapered piece of steel through your hot steel so that it uh, makes a wider hole than you start out with. Unfortunately, a side effect of that is that makes a tapered hole, right? So one way to get around this is to pound your drift all the way through. That'll make a perfect cylinder because at some point you're going to have a cylindrical part to hold on to. But that was, that was too wide for my usage. So I didn't do that. Instead... I pounded my drift through, not through all the way, but you know, in a bit, and then uh, flipped the piece over after another heat, and and uh, pounded it in the other way. This made the taper go both directions, so it's really more an hourglass shape than a conical shape, but. That's still uh, still a little better than just a regular old cone. They make all different kinds of drifts too. Like if you watch other smiths, and I'm gonna get there eventually you'll find that they talk about hammer eye drifts or axe eye drifts and what that refers to is the shape of the hole that that particular drift makes so instead of just a straight cone a hammer eye drift actually makes kind of an oval shape instead of you know a round eye um, an axe eye kind of makes a teardrop shape a very long one and they make all kinds of drifts for all kinds of reasons. I don't even know all of them, I'm sure.
And see, there's a hole where I did not punch it out all the way. So I had the, the biscuit, as I've seen it called some places, left out on the outside, and I had to pry it off. Now I'm just going to test fit my, my uh, rivet in there. Find out that it only fits at an angle. Probably because I screwed up my alignment. So I think maybe I can just tap it in. And then I go, nope, that's a terrible idea. So I pull it out and put that back in to get hot again. So in case you haven't noticed, I flipped my um, my shop arrangement. Normally I have my anvil to my right when I'm working, but today I decided to try it to my left. That way I could align the camera so that you would see things from the perspective of my tong hand. Um, also tried to get more of my equipment in the, the camera view which worked out okay but I'm gonna do something different with it next time let me bring the anvil closer for example so that you can actually see what I'm doing over there thankfully the anvil wasn't the focus of this Another rivet test fit. That one worked out perfect. So, put it aside to cool off a little bit. And on this one, we're gonna go ahead and drift out the other side of that hole so that it's right. Another thing of note, um, these reins I, on these tongs were a little short. I would advise lengthening them some before working them without tongs, like I'm doing here. But good came of that. Um, a couple times I burnt myself, I found all the holes in my welding gloves and decided to replace them. So now I've got the rivet in and it's time to flatten the head. And that's pretty easy actually. It's already got a head on one side. A rivet works by having, <clears throat> by being driven through two holes and then having one side mushroomed out, or both sides mushroomed out really, so that it can't pass back through those holes. One side already started out that way, the other side needed some work. So I went ahead and did that. And then found that my tongs would not budge. Eventually they did. But you gotta heat them up, get them to a nice high red hot, and then work them a lot. You don't want them too hot because that. Uh, welding temperatures are not good for this use, but, uh, yeah. Now to size them, I got a bar out that I'm using for something else. I'll go into that tool later, but I just needed the bar right now. Set the bar in the jaws, tapped it a couple times to make sure the, the jaws were lined up on the bar. And check that they didn't get stuck again. And yeah. I 
this point I almost decided I was done but then I decided you know what I could probably use with use a bit of tweaking on these so I come over to the device and you can see they're not straight yet so I went ahead and got the scale off his bed and back in the fire they go find out or get them all straightened up this is uh, this is the long drawn out part the real tedious part of these I finally just accepted that they were good enough because they were functional and the alignment wasn't perfect but it was gripping things everything I put in there fine and the jaws open and closed great but yeah the handles aren't the reins aren't exactly straight they're not it's not perfect I'm gonna do better on the next couple but in case you haven't noticed, the steel is discolored all the way up to my glove, which means it's still hot in the place I'm holding it. The only thing protecting me is that welding glove, and it's not even doing a good job. A little more alignment, and that'll be the end of it, really. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm going to make more tongs in the future, and I'll see you for those. In the meantime, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.